Welcome to some Grasshopper tutorials. This tutorial is the very, very first Grasshopper tutorial, and it's going to start with an assumption that you have zero knowledge about Grasshopper. And so we're going to start slow, and then over the course of a few videos, we'll start moving faster and faster. So if you know some of these things, feel free to fast forward. Let's start with launching Grasshopper. So I've got Rhino open. You can do one of two things. You can type Grasshopper in the command prompt. And there's also an icon in Rhino 6 that says launch Grasshopper. I'm going to click that and it launches another window. And it's on top of the Rhino interface. So what I like to do is to just pull Rhino all the way to the right so it engages on the right. And then I like to pull the Grasshopper window all the way to the left so it engages on the left. And then it, we have a kind of full layout and we can see both things. This is helpful and useful because there is a connection and we're going to build connections between Rhino and Grasshopper. So the first thing to know is that you'll have two separate files. You'll have a Rhino file and you'll have a Grasshopper file. So one of the things that we can do when we start is we can we can say a new, create a new file in Rhino, and I'm going to say large objects feet, say open, and I can even save this right away and find a, a grasshopper file or a grasshopper folder, and let's call this tutorial one, and I'll save it. What I also want to do is to save my grasshopper file. So I'll go up over to here on the left and say file. Uh, let's see. We haven't done anything yet, so it's not going to let us save anything. Uh, we can also say new document. There we go. And now we can save this. And I'll save this in the same place. And typically what happens as I start typing, this finds the, the Rhino file that I just created. And so I can click on this. I don't want to save it with the same suffix, but I'll also call it tutorial one and say save. So now I have both of these. I'm going to maximize my, how do I maximize my perspective view here. So what I want to do to start is to maybe make a couple of simple connections just to show how these work. We'll come back. We'll deal with more of these connections over time, but I just want to highlight a couple of aspects for you. So let's just make a s one point. So I'm going to select the single point tool. I'm going to type zero and enter. And this puts it at the origin. And maybe while I'm at it, I'll also make a line. Doesn't matter how big, doesn't matter what direction it goes in. And I just want to move it slightly. So that I can see that those two things are separate. So now that I've done that, in Grasshopper on the left, I'm going to I'm going to pull one of the components down, and maybe just to talk about the simple interface that's here, we can see that there's a series of tabs, just like Rhino, and there are a lot of tools within Grasshopper. We're going to get into some of these, many of these, and you'll get a better sense for what they are. For now what we'll do is we'll just go to parameters, which is the first one. And we can see if we click on geometry, this will give us all of the components that are within here. And so what I'd like to do is, is click point and place point here. And then I can also choose curve and place curve here. There's another way to, to select those components and put them in our canvas and that's by double clicking and that allows us to search so i could type and this is pretty intuitive pretty logical i can type point and you'll see it gives us a set of components that have to deal with points and in this case i'll select or i don't have to select it but i could select the point with the hexagon which is which is the same thing that we have right here and I'll, I'll delete that. What we want to do to build a connection between Rhino and, and Grasshopper is that we can 
for these components that are, imagine them as empty containers, and we'll see their colors will change as we add to them, and there's a little bubble to the top right, and it says it, it's not collecting data. Right click on it, and then come halfway down and it says set one point. Now, what it's doing is it's looking and waiting for us to click. So if we come over to Rhino and click, now we can see that this point is no longer, or that component is no longer orange, it's gray. And as we can see a couple of things happen between left and right here. If I do not have that container or that component selected, there's a red X at the point. And, and the X is because that's the designation for a point. If I select on the point container, we can see that X turns green. The same will be true for the curve. So if we right click on the curve, we can say set one curve. We'll come over here, we'll select it. We can see it turns green and this is green. And so there's a connection between these, right? It's, it's black here. And the, and the reason why it's black is what I'll show you as well, is that I want to hide both of these elements in Rhino. And I'll do that by clicking on hide objects, the light bulb. Now what's happened is that the geometry, and I, I want to start by really building this kind of foundational understanding about the connections between the two. On the right side, that's geometry. And those are the things that you've always modeled and the things that you've always worked with. On the left, within Grasshopper, these still are, are still here. We can see that they're still visible. These are uh, symbols or semantic objects for the objects that are there on the right. So what we also have to imagine is that in Rhino right now, there's a, there's a kind of ghost of a representation of geometry. It's not actual geometry. And so if we tried to zoom this window, it's going to tell us that nothing is, that, that did work, but it's going to tell us that nothing, nothing's there, right? If I select this, it doesn't select anything. If I select these, then these turn green. And so this is what's useful to see is just this relationship between the two. What we can also do, and I'm just trying to think of the kind of simplest thing to do here, is to let's maybe rotate the curve around that point. Very, very basic. And again, how would we rotate? Let's type rotate here. We can see there's a number of different rotates but the, the simplest one and the one that we want to work with right here is at the bottom. And, and you can also see it as you mouse over, it gives you a little bit more of a description about what's there. Rotate a vector, rotate an object. We're going to rotate an object in a plane. And we can see as we bring this component in, it brings in a plane with it. And so what I also want to do is to get you to start thinking about working with Grasshopper and starting to understand that there's going to be moments where you're incredibly frustrated and there's going to be moments where you're like, why isn't this working the way that I want it to? Just pay attention to what the components are asking for. And if you mouse over these, you'll see that rotate. And, and what we're going to do is we're working on the canvas. We can zoom in and out of this canvas. We're going to connect these components and there's, we're going to typically move from left to right. And we're going to add, we're going to take inputs and outputs from each of these components. And so if we look at rotate, we can see that, and I mouse over these inputs on the left and the outputs on the right, the input is base geometry, a rotation angle in radians, and a rotation plane. And we can also see that a rotation plane was added, and it says one locally defined value as the world x, y. And that's exactly because we put our point at zero, at zero, 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 the plane is in the right place. We're, we're going to do a lot of work later in the semester of understanding how to relocate that plane as a reference so that we can use it for other things. But for now, let's just start really simply and come to the output of the point, 
And as you pull out from that, you'll see it creates this curved line. Let's plug this in, and you can see it kind of snaps to these. We want to plug it into the geometry. So what we want to say is that the input for the rotate is the point. That's the thing that we're, and actually that's not what I want to do. I want to rotate the curve. So I'm going to place that in instead. So now we see already our rotate has a plane. There's an angle that's set to half of pi. I want to do a couple things right now is I want to change that angle in radians. If I right click over it, I can change that to degrees. I don't think anyone is used to working in radians. So we change this to degrees. We see we get a little degrees symbol here. And then let's make a slider. And we can find sliders in a couple of ways. We can come up to parameters and inputs, and we can create a number slider. We can place that here. In this case, because we want this to be angles, or because we want it to be an angle, we can double click where it says slider, and we can set the minimum. And this is the fun thing about sliders is that we can set kind of min and max, and we can slide everything in between. We can change these from uh, floating numbers or rational numbers to integers, even and odd. And so, and we can change the number of digits. For now, let's say the, the minimum will be one degree, or let's say 10 degrees, and let's say the maximum will be 80 degrees. And we can say OK. Now we can see our slider slides everything from 10. We don't need three decimal places either, so I could double click this again, turn it to zero decimal places. And so now we can see that as I move this, it goes from 10 to 80. The output of that, if I mouse over it, it tells me that the value is 38. So what I want to do is pull the output from that to the input of the angle. So now we can see on the right hand side, our line or our curve has already started rotating. And as we move, our slider, we can see that our line is rotating between 0 and 80. And so what I want to build with you is an understanding that we're going to design things, but we're no longer designing for just one fixed, static kind of situation. Every, or almost every, we'll see, every, many of the decisions that you make might have a range to them. And so all of a sudden, what was the way that you were traditionally modeling something in Rhino, where you would model it kind of step by step, click by click, and once you had it, that thing was fixed. Because of this associativity between Grasshopper and Rhino, we're going to imagine many variations, many possibilities, because of the tools that we have with Grasshopper. And so even within this, we've got a range, and that range could be between 0 and 5,000. That range, we, we set those ranges. Right now, we just made an arbitrary decision to set this between 10 and 80. And it can be anything in between. So we have that, and so we have this relationship. The other thing that we have that I want to make you aware of right away is that we're going to build this understanding and the intent and the ideas behind the geometry that you're building in this semantic procedural model in Grasshopper on the left. Every step, every component that you add leaves breadcrumbs all the way through. And quite literally, I do mean kind of breadcrumbs in that we can see we have our rotate and we still have our curve. And so it didn't just take our curve and move it and even move will move a new instance of the thing and leave the original there. So we can always reference the previous thing that we have by referencing any of these. We can hide them. Let's say we no longer want this the, the original line. We can right click it and we can turn off the preview of that. We can turn off the preview of the point. Uh, can we? 
it seems that we can't turn off this plane. Uh, I think because that plane is a default. So what we could do is make, if we come down here, we can see it's XY. Let's make an XY plane. And we can see that ends up in that spot. I'll plug it in. And the benefit of doing this is that I can pre turn that preview off and now that's hidden. And we can see these get a little darker in terms of gray. And now we can see we've got our, our line that's rotating there. Um, so we can search for components. We can find components. If you have a component, let's say someone shares something with you, the other thing that you can do is you can, let's see if I, I don't use this very often. I think if you hold Control and Alt and click on an object, left click and hold it down, it will show you these arrows and will show you exactly where that tool is located. Any of these. And so this is an easy way, to, if someone, if you, if you work with a reference file, if you do something else, how did they build that? If you don't quite see or understand what that component is, use Control and Alt and left click and it'll show you what tab and what um, kind of menu item that's under. So I think those are some good things to think about. Um, so we have these, we hide these things, we have them there. Let's do, let's do this just once more, just as a very simple way. And, and I can also show you, show you that we can um, copy these as well. And so what I want to do, knowing that I want to maybe add another line at the end of this line, let me rotate. So what I want to do is I want to take the input of another curve which is the curve that comes out of here. And so, you know, for now, let's do something like this, just so it helps us understand that from here, we're getting this curve. I can hide the rotate. And so we have our new curve. We have our old curve and our new curve. So we're gonna need geometry, which will be our curve. We're gonna need an angle and a and a slider, and then we're going to need an xy plane. In order to set the xy plane, we're going to need a point. So let's take, we'll, I'll show you the way that, just, that this branches really simply. And so let's make, I know another tool that's called endpoints of a line. And so I can plug in, we can see this wants a curve. We'll plug in the curve, and now we see we get the endpoints that are highlighted at the end of our rotated line. And no matter where this line moves, those endpoints follow. And I can add a point that comes out of this as another container. And we can do something here. We can see which one is the start. OK, that one turns green. We actually want the end. So I have that. So I'm going to hide the preview of the endpoints, just because I want that one point that comes out of it. And then what I'll do is I'm going to hold down my shift. I'm going to select the, the slider, the XY plane, and the rotate. Control C, Control V. And then I'm going to slide this over here. And we can see rotate still is connected. This rotate is still connected back to that first curve. but. Remember, I want to rotate my second curve. So why don't I do that? And the XY plane, if I unhide it, we can see is still all the way back there. So let's, let's rotate this. Our rotate is hidden, so we'll preview that. So now we can see this rotate is moving. And it's moving in relationship, because remember, we're rotating the rotated curve. And so you can already get a sense for the way that we're building up these relationships between these. But let's go one step further, because I actually want my XY, my new XY plane to be based on that point. 
So now we can see we can rotate this curve around the endpoint of the previous one. And as we move, as we rotate the previous line, we can see the way that that moves. Let's go one step further. And I know for some of you this might already be too much. We've strung a few of these things together. And I'm also just going to hide a couple of these things. We want to keep this curve. Actually, we can keep our first curve on. All of these things are fine. Maybe I'll just hide the plane. But just get a sense that the plane is moving. This plane is moving because it's connected to that point. That point is connected to this line, which is the rotate. So the plane is moving as that curve rotates. So I'll hide that plane. So now we have this connection. The, the last thing that I want to do, maybe to just show another kind of fun thing, is that we can actually feed the same input or the same parameters into multiple inputs. And what I mean by that is that we have this separate angle that we can control this other line here. And again, remember, we can change. Let's make this minus 90 and plus 180. Right, now this slider will be able to rotate around much more. And that's fine. But maybe we don't want to have individual control out of all of these elements. I'm going to take the output, so we can have multiple outputs from the same component, and feed this in to the rotate. We can see now this slider is no longer connected because we chose one over the other. We could delete it. And now, as we move this slider, we can see both lines moving. And so I don't want to go too far. It already seems like this is a 20 minute long video tutorial that we haven't really shown much, but what I want to do is just show you basic interface, basic aspects of what's going on. And the last thing that I'll do is to just maybe build that connection for you between Rhino and Grasshopper. And one thing that we can do, because I told you all of these are kind of ghosted representations of geometry, they're not actual geometry. If we want to get geometry within Rhino, we have to right click a specific object or all of our objects, but in this case I'll do the rotate and we can see bake. Bake will take that representation and kind of and do what it says, it bakes it into real geometry. We can choose what layer to put it on and we can say okay. So what happens, we can see now there's a black line here. If I move this, we can see that black line stays. That black line is real geometry within Rhino, and we can select it. Nothing else can be selected in here because these are representations of geometry. It's only when we bake something does that become actual geometry, and when you bake it, it becomes static geometry. And so we want to be kind of mindful when we bake something because it's no longer associative and no longer parametric. But that's, that's that aspect of baking. Here's the other thing, as just a quick example to show you, is that objects can also be, here's a really simple way to leverage the power of Grasshopper. And I'm just going to make the simplest of lofts between two curves. We can say I just elevated this curve. I'll make it a little higher in the z direction. And we have these two curves. And the capability that Grasshopper gives us, watch if I loft these two in Rhino. I'll just simply say OK. If I change my curves, and I, can, I have the control points here, if I move the curves, nothing happens with nothing happens with the loft, right? The loft is fixed. But what I could do in the simplest of ways is create two curve components. 
control Z and control V and set these. So I'll set the bottom one to the bottom curve. We can see that just turned green. I'll set the top curve to the top curve. And in Grasshopper, I'll create a loft. And the way that I do this is to just give it one curve and then I give it the second curve. But as we know from what we did a minute ago, when I add this, it, it deletes the other one. What we can do is we can hold down shift. You can see as I hold down shift, it gives us a little plus. We can have two curves here. Now, this is a grasshopper loft. It's red. If we click on it, it turns green. But what's nice about this is that it has the associativity so that if we do what we did a second ago and we go to change these curves, the curve changes with it. Or sorry, the loft changes with it. I can move this point and the loft updates. Again, the loft is a representation of geometry. It's not actually in Rhino. It's a grasshopper representation, but we can bake this. Once we bake it, it becomes static geometry again. And so Rhino gives us, oh, sorry. Rhino gives us this option Crappy move to. Here we go. Rhino gives us this option that we can use the static geometry, which we can see here. We can click on it, we can do it, but it's not parametric in the way that the grasshopper representations are. So we're going to do a lot of work with this back and forth, working between these two and, and um, uh, building these parametric relationships and starting to design parametrically. Right? You're no longer going to design just one thing. You're going to imagine these things as a system. The last thing that I'll say is that you should always be moving your components. What I would, what I would suggest not doing is put a component, put a component, string them together, and think that it's going to work. All the way through, I want to be moving my parameters, increasing the number, changing these things, and testing it all the way through. And in some ways, imagine kind of training it all the way through. If there's an error, you're going to find an error, or you're going to find a break in logic when you start moving it around. Wait a minute. It doesn't behave the way that I expect it to behave. Why is that? What did I connect that I shouldn't have connected? Is something breaking? Is there a bug in the system? So I just want to advocate for always using these kind of sliders or these variables or these parameters and moving them around and making sure that the behavior of your, your representation or the behavior of your geometry mirrors that with your intent and so that it's doing what you think it should do. And, so, and we'll constantly work through these things and we'll continue to imagine this thing as a kind of living, breathing kind of organism that we're working on understanding its behavior and kind of editing and changing its behavior. So the last thing that we should do is just save our files. And we can do that simply by saving our grasshopper file on the right with the, by hitting the, the disk. And we can do the same coming over to the grasshopper side and saying save document. Both of these separate files have been saved independently. When it comes time to open them, you open the Rhino file and then launch Grasshopper and then from Grasshopper find your file and open that file and these connections will, will still exist. So I hope this gives you a little bit of grounding to the most foundational aspects of the relationship between Grasshopper and Rhino. And we're going to continue to build with these. So let me know if you have any questions. And we'll, we'll begin the first assignment by building on these relationships and talking more about them. So I hope this helps. And I look forward to uh, continuing the discussion with you. Thanks.